all of life is precious. And, uh, and January is a new beginning, is it not? A beginning to a new year. So what a better time for us to celebrate uh, the beginning of life and, uh, and giving people the opportunity to experience, uh, giving children the opportunity to experience life. You know what? Uh, life is filled with gray areas, isn't it? Isn't it filled with those areas in which you, you ask yourself, well, man, what should I do here? Is that really that big of a deal? And should I, should I go this way? Should I do this? Um, and, and in those gray areas, I don't know that you can always come to the preacher and say, hey, Billy, what should I do with this? But life is not one of those gray areas. Uh, life is something that God has pretty ma much made black and white and he said he's shown and he said that he values that and aren't you glad that he values life aren't, aren't you glad that you have had the opportunity to live to be here today to wake up for a new day and and life is not only valuable for, uh, for children who are unborn life is valuable uh, in, in each and every human being on the face of this planet, which is why we have a group of, uh, of people who are in India right now doing missions because life is valuable to God. Whether, whether, this, whether they have white skin, whether they have brown skin, whether they have black skin, whether they speak English, whether they, they speak uh, Spanish, whatever language they speak, our God has a heart, has a desire for life, and He has a heart for the nations. So we have the privilege right now, and we're going to take a privilege right now. We're just going to pray for these, these brothers and this sister who is in, in India right now, uh, following God's leading and God's calling, uh, doing, doing ministry. Okay, So if you would, just bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for today. Thank you for the life that you've given us this morning. And God, thank you for giving us life, period. God, thank you for eternal life through Jesus, for his death on the cross and for his resurrection from the dead. Father God, I, I just thank you that you've called uh, these of our number to, to India for these next two weeks to do ministry, Father. And I'm not sure where they're at right now. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, God. But Father, I just want to pray for your hand to be upon them right now. God, I pray that you would protect them from all harm. And God, I pray that you would strengthen them. God, protect them from sicknesses, protect them from, from hurts, God. And, and in the midst of whatever difficulties come, because they always come, God, make yourself known to them. God, help them to influence people towards seeing that you are the one true living God. That in this world, there are many, many, many gods that we follow. But you're the one true living God. You're the reason that we're here today to worship you. And you're the reason we listen right now to hear from you, to hear what your word and what your message is to us. So, Father, I just want to pray that uh, you'd open each of our ears. God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And uh, just speak to us right now. Light our way. And I love you, Lord. And it's in the precious and wonderful and awesome name of your son, Jesus Christ, that I pray and ask this. Amen. You know, our, our human nature often leads us to take the easy way out. Like, for example, when you leave church today, you're probably going to go out to eat. And when you go out to eat, you're, gonna, you're probably going to have a conversation that goes something like this. Where, where should we go? Well, I want to go over here. And, and, and then somebody can say, no, it's probably going to be too busy right now. Especially if the preacher's long-winded. So, so what you'll do is you'll, you'll look for the place where the line's going to be shorter. And you get to wait less. And I'm not saying that's bad. Okay, that's, I'm going to do the same thing. I want to go somewhere where I don't have to wait quite so long. Or when, you, when you're on your way home from work, you want, to, you want to find the easy way home. You want to find out where there's the, less, the least amount of traffic, where you can miss the most amount of people, so you can just get home and, and, and be home. We like to take 
the easy way out. That's why when those of us who aren't very good cooks, some of you aren't like this, but then some of you are, um, who aren't very good cooks and don't cook very often, when we look for food in the, in, in the grocery store, we, find, we look for those things that say, just add Good, I'm not the only one that does that. <laughs> so we want, we want the easy way out. That's why we have microphone, mic, microphones, uh, microwaves in our home. Because we, we want the easy way out. That's why we have fast food restaurants. Because we want the easy way out. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There's sometimes when you like the easy way out. But I'm going to be, I'm willing to bet the, thing that you, the things that you've done that were most worthwhile in this life weren't easy. The things that really count were things that were difficult, that were hard. I mean, if you built a strong marriage, if, if, let, let, let me just get a, a show of hands. Raise your hand if you and your spouse have been, or even if you, you lost your spouse, but you, you're, uh, you were married for 50 years or more, raise your hand, let's just see. That's right, yes. If you have survived 10 years or more in marriage, it wasn't easy, was it? There, there, was, there was no easy way out in order, in order to build a marriage that lasts, in order to raise children. It's not, it's not easy. If, you, if you've raised children, you know that the easy way wasn't the most effective way. If you've ever, uh, if you've ever tried to, to lose weight or to get in shape, if you've ever tried to, uh, to, to get out of debt, you, took, you, you know that it wasn't easy. The easy way is not always the best way. And that's what we talked about about, about two weeks ago. Well, today, what I, wanna, I want us to go, go one, one step further. Because what we, another thing that we looked at was how we are, everybody wants something from us. I mean, you go to work, your boss wants something from you. You got, you got needs from your family, your kids, your, your grandkids your spouse, they all need something from you. And then, of course, you come to church, and guess what? The church needs something from you. I mean, some of you dread seeing certain people because you know when, you, when, when they start walking your direction, they're probably going to ask you to help with something. They're probably going to ask you to give something. You, you like seeing me right now, but there's probably going to come a time when you're going to think, oh, no, here comes the preacher. What, is, what does he want? Because... We need, uh, people are always trying to get something from us. People are always asking us to do things. And so what we learned in Mark chapter 1 a couple weeks ago was that Jesus had a, had a plan for dealing with those things. And Jesus' plan for dealing with those things was to make spending time with His Heavenly Father the top priority in His life. And so last week, we added on to that foundation about, making, about spending time with your Heavenly Father. And what we talked about, we talked about the missing link, if you'll remember. Uh, about the missing link to, to our time with God. It, it's, it's not even that we don't try to read the Bible, maybe, in our time with God. Although, many of us have probably kind of, at times, given up on that. But it's not that we, we, we give up or we, uh, that we don't try to read the Bible or we don't try to study the Bible. Or even when you come to church that you don't try to listen and try to understand what's being taught. See, the missing link in our, in our time with God and in His Word that we talked about last week was meditation. It was stopping to listen to God. Stopping to see, to hear from Him what He has to say and what His Word means. I would encourage you, I would challenge you to go and check out on our, on our website uh, last week's message if you didn't get to hear it because it's, it's a challenge and, it's, and, and I believe it really is the missing link for many of us in our time with God. Well, I want to go one step further today and I want to talk about another thing that we do when we open up or, or when we spend time with our Heavenly Father. In fact, this is one of those things that, that most of us do on a, on a regular basis. This is one of those things that we, that we give our attention to. And that thing is prayer. 
I want to talk about prayer this morning for just a few minutes. But I don't want to talk about the kind of prayer that you can do driving down the road. Although, gratefully, we can pray driving down the road. Most of us do pray driving down the road. We have to, don't we? Uh, I don't want to talk about the kind of prayer that you can pray uh, just, uh, just anywhere you're at, you know, with your eyes open, with your eyes... I, I, I want to talk about the kind of prayer that you do when you're alone with God. And that's what I want us to spend our time on today. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew. And I've had several people ask me, and I keep for mention, forgetting to mention this. I, I read and I study out of the, uh, out of the Holman Christian Standard uh, Bible. So, uh, so which is, uh, it's, it's the Southern Baptist uh, version that, that they put out for their, their uh, Sunday school curriculum. So uh, it's, just, it's just my favorite version to read right now. Six months from now, it may be different um, because I can change my mind. And that's just how it is, right? So if you got your Bible in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 are known as the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus did, it says in Matthew 5, 1, that he, that he went up on a mountain and he preached. Well, that's pretty deep spiritual stuff, isn't it? See, the Bible's not hard to understand. He went on, up on a mountain and he preached a message. And I love the message that he preached because it's almost like, like Jesus is just kind of laying out there in this message. This is how you live a God-honoring, a Christ-honoring life. If you want to know what God expects, if you want to know what, what God wants you to do, how God wants you to live, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in, in, in that, he, he talks about things like what it looks like to be holy. He talks about what it looks like to be happy in your relationship with God. He talks about things he talks about things like uh, like the spiritual disciplines of our life. I mean, he'll he talks about uh, fasting. He talks about giving. You know, we get, just got done giving our tithes and our offerings, and he talks about how we're to give. But then the, the other discipline he talks about is this discipline of prayer. So in Matthew chapter 5, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 5. And he says this, he says, Whenever you pray, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Now this is a great verse to pay attention to. Because if you've ever invited somebody to church, or if you've invited enough people to church, you're going to hear somebody... Uh, the, the reason that they don't go to church anymore, they've, they've just kind of become, become upset or tired of the church, is because the, the answer they'll give is, well, there's just so many hypocrites in the church. And he, they're not wrong, are they? That's what's so scary about it. See, the, one of the real issues that we faced is, or, or one of the real struggles that each of us faces is, is that is that there are things like hypocrisy that are e easy to see in other people but impossible to see in the mirror. I mean, none of you would look at... look Now, just raise your hand if, you, if you're a hypocrite. Oh, I'm, I'm not a hypocrite. But yet, we're all hypocrites at one time or another. We all put on a mask. We all put on, put on a show for somebody because we don't want them to know what's really going on. Because we want people to see how strong or how tough we are, or how spiritual we are. We all go through. That's, that's a struggle that all of us have. And so Jesus says, whenever you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. He says, be different than the hypocrites. And by the way, the hypocrites that Jesus is talking about here is this group of people called the, the scribes and the Pharisees. They were kind of the, the religious elite. And now, when you think about this, you got to understand that these, these scribes and these Pharisees, they, it, it's, it's not most of the time that they were just, just trying, to be, trying to be holier than thou. They really, really thought that, that the way they were living and the way they acted towards others was, was the right way. But, but he goes on and he talks, he talks about this a little bit more. He says, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, he says, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. And he said, I assure you, they've got 
their reward. So here's kind of how it worked. There were certain times that were set apart to pray. Like like every day there would be a time at 6 o'clock in in the morning, at 9 o'clock a.m., at at 12 noon, and then at 3 o'clock p.m. Those were set aside times to pray. And what the Pharisees and the scribes would do is they would find themselves in very public places during these times. And so what Jesus is doing here, and, and, and we got to understand something. Jesus is able to do something that, that, not, not, that most of us really aren't qualified to do. He's able to look, look deeper into people's hearts than, than we're able to. And so Jesus, was, he could see these people were doing it just to be seen by men. And he says, they've got their reward. He says, congratulations, guys. We've seen you. That's all you get. We're going to walk away. We're going to forget about this. And that's, all, that's, all, that's all your reward. And he goes on in verse 6 and he says, but. Everybody say that with me. But. But when you pray, go into your private room. Shut your door and pray to your father who's in secret. At which point somebody stands up and says, wait, Jesus, hold on just a second. I got a question. Are you saying that we're supposed to pray even if nobody knows that we're praying? To which Jesus answers, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Wait, so so Jesus, does that mean that we're not allowed to pray in front of people? At which point Jesus says, I didn't say that. The point is not, the point he's making is is that the point's not for you to be seen by people. Because he goes on to say this in verse 6. He says, and your father, your heavenly father, God who sees in secret will reward you. So here's a key truth I I want you to grab onto. I want you to pay attention to. Prayer is about God seeing your heart, not people seeing your actions. Prayer is about God seeing your heart, not people seeing your actions. And you see, when God sees your heart and He sees that you're sincere, because by the way, y'all don't know whether I'm sincere or not. You think you know, right? But you don't know. I look out there and I think, well, I think he's sincere. I think she's sincere. But you know what? I can't really tell that. But you see, God can. And when God looks at a heart and he sees a heart that's sincere, he says that he rewards. Jesus said he rewards those who who sincerely seek him in prayer. So if you want to be blessed by God, if you want a reward from God in the future, and maybe today, do this. When we leave here, not right now, when I'm done, you go get alone. Get all by yourself, just you and God. And you pray and you seek Him. You want reward from God? That's one thing that you can do. Just get along with God and pray and talk and communicate with Him. But he goes on and he says this. He says, and when you pray, don't babble. When you pray, don't babble like the idolaters do. In other words, don't keep repeating uh, meaningless, meaningless phrases like the idolaters do. The idolaters, your, your version of the Bible may say Gentiles. But he's talking about those who don't know God, those who don't have a relationship with God. Don't just babble and keep repeating meaningless words like the idolaters do. He says, since they imagine that they'll be heard for their many words. He says, don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. So here's the thing. God is a spirit. 
But God is a personal spirit. In other words, you can have a personal relationship with God. You can know God personally, and that's God's plan. That's God's desire for each and every one of us. That we would know Him, that we would have a, an intimate, a close relationship with Him. That we would be able to walk with Him. He wants us to know Him personally. The same way that you know the person you're sitting next to personally. The same way that you have a relationship, that you talk to that person. He wants you to know them personally. He wants you to have that kind of relationship with them. It's like me and my wife don't have a script every morning for what we're going to say. You know, it's, it's, if, if I ever come to a point where, where I kiss my wife just because it's, just because it's a habit or, or I say good morning, good morning, my love, because it's a habit and it's just a script, it's no longer out of sincerity. And that's how most of us treat God if we're not careful, isn't it? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You know... Which is cute for kids, right? But once you get a little bit older, you realize there's something more needed there, don't you? You see, God desires a personal relationship with us. And in personal relationships, we don't have a script. It, it comes from our heart. So he goes on in verse 9 and he says, he says this. He says, therefore, you should pray like this. In other words, he said... He said, I've told you this is how you don't pray, but now I want to tell you how you should pray. Our Father, he says, in heaven. And I love that word for Father because, because in, in the Bible that word is Abba, which means Daddy. It means it's that kind of relationship that you have with, with your Daddy. He says, our Father, our Daddy who's in heaven, he says, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, he says, when we pray, our, our attitude is to, is to be, God, I want you to do what you want to do, not what I want to do. In other words, my time with God in prayer is about, about God's agenda, not just my agenda. And he goes on and he says this, he says, and forgive us. Actually, he says in verse 11, he says, Give us, our day, give us today our daily bread. And he goes in verse 12 and says, And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In other words, seek God's forgiveness. We're going to talk more about that in just a second. He says, And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So there he's just asking God, God, protect me from the one who is, the, uh, who is the, the controller of all temptation, who is the originator of all temptations in this world. You know, we often don't take the devil seriously, do we? In, 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 our, in the nation that we live in, the devil is somebody that we really, even in churches, we don't like to talk about. And he's not really just, he's just not taken seriously. But Jesus took him seriously. Jesus had very good reason to take him seriously because there was at one point when he's spending 40 days out in the wilderness fasting and seeking God and the devil comes to him and the devil tempts him. You see, Jesus knew very well how real the devil, how real Satan is. Yet we just don't seem to take him so seriously. But, but Jesus says when we pray, you need to take him so seriously that when you pray, you need to ask God to help protect you or to protect you from the evil one. Because he's out to get you. God, God's not out to get you. He's not out to get me. God wants what's best for you. He wants what's best for me. But the devil's out to get us. And so what, what Jesus says, he says... Uh, pray to God and say, God, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. And then, then the next line is awesome. Listen to this. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In other words, in prayer, we're to acknowledge the power of God in our prayer. He said, God, yours is the kingdom. 
All power belongs to you. All glory belongs to you. He's the one that has the power to give, to provide everything that we need. All of those things that you, you may think that God doesn't care about, God cares about. All of those things that you think God's been silent on when you've prayed and you've asked Him, God cares about. That He has answers for you and He's, he's ready and waiting and He wants to communicate with you. And that's part of what this, this, prayer is, this prayer is all about that Jesus gives. Is many of us, we just, we're just not real sure how to, how to communicate with God, are we? And so when we do pray, when we do communicate with God, we, just, we don't receive what we ask for and we think it's God's fault. I wonder if maybe it's not God's fault. I wonder if maybe it's, it's our fault. Because we haven't learned how to communicate with Him. Now, you, when we think about God, when we think about faith and that kind of stuff, and we think about prayer, we think, well, well, that should be easy, that should be simple. But yet, when we relate it to, to the relationship between men and women, it's not, it's not surprising at all when we think how complicated communication is. I mean, is it not complicated communicating between men and women. Okay? Yes, no? Y'all y'all got it all together. It's just us preachers that have trouble with that stuff, right? <laughs> the, the funniest thing happened, I, I just got to share, share this with you. Um, of course, we were two weeks without my wife, so I was expecting her and my, my daughter to get in town on uh, on uh, Monday night. Well, we leave church last Sunday night. We go out to eat, and when we get home, we're you know I'm just just driving down our street, and I see this 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 white Tahoe in a driveway. Well, the guy just in front of our house has a white Tahoe, but see his rims are black, and ours are just those those chrome those those silver rims. And I think, did he get new rims? <laughs> and I get closer, and I realize. My wife is sitting in the, and daughter are sitting in the driveway with our, with, in, in the Tahoe waiting for me and my son to get home. You know, talk about a surprise. Well, but see, here's, I didn't know this was going on. So on the way home, I tell, I tell Billy, I said, hey, call your mom. Actually, I said, text your mom. Because it's, it's very rare, even when we don't see each other for, for a few days, it's very rare that we don't talk a couple times a day. Well, Sunday, she never called. And so finally, I called her, or we texted her, and I said, hey, call me when you get a chance. And you know what her reply was? Oh, I'm tired. Let's talk tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I hadn't seen her in two weeks. What have I done wrong? Listen, we understand how difficult it is to communicate with one another when it's between a, a husband and a wife or between men and women. But we expect that communicating with, with almighty, holy, righteous God is going is, is gonna to be a snap. That there's not some tricks or there's not some things that we need to understand when we communicate with God. Well, the reality is... We do need to understand some things about how to communicate with God. And that's what Jesus deals with here. And he deals, and it's actually dealt with throughout the scriptures. But I want, but we're going to hit on one thing because Jesus hits on it right here. That's very, very important. If you want to have com good communication with God, listen to what he says in verse fourteen. He says, "For if you forgive people their wrongdoings, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing." Well, that's weird. Jesus says, talks about this twice. He said it in, uh, just before in the, in the, in the, uh, in the prayer that he's pr given to them. He says, uh, he says, you need to forgive others. Forgive us as we've forgiven those who, who have sinned against us. Jesus mentions it twice. i got a question for you. Which words in the Bible are important? All of them are important. And not only are all the words in the Bible important, but, the, but where they're put and how many times they're in the Bible are important. If Jesus talks about this twice within just three or four verses, that means there's something to this. 
That should send up a flag saying, oh, you need to pay attention to this. This is a big deal. So he, he comes and, and he, he says that forgiveness is important. Forgiveness is important if you, want to, if you want to have an effective prayer life. If you want to have a, a close relationship with God, then you need to be forgiven by God. Now, the Bible says that, that, that all of our sins have already been paid for on the cross. So I have a relationship with God no matter what. But my relationship when, when I've got sin in my life with God is kind, is kind of broken. It's like for me and my wife, we're going to be married no matter what. Because we've, we've made the vows. We've said, we said, I do. But just because we've made that commitment doesn't mean that our relationship is always right where it needs to be, does it? Because sometimes I do dumb things, right? And the only way, and sometimes she does too, but I'm not going to bring that up. Um, the only way for that relationship to come back together is for us to for us to be reconciled to come together on that and it's the same is true with God we've got to be forgiven by God and to, to be forgiven by God this is great first John 1 9 says if you confess your sins he'll be faithful and he'll be just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness so you can have a relationship with God but here Jesus Jesus brings one more thing into it he says, if you want to be forgiven by God, you've got, to, you've got to forgive others. You've got to begin to square away some of those things in your life that you've not been willing to ask forgiveness for. So, let me just give you a couple of quick points of application. The first one is this. You can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's awesome. The creator of heaven and earth. The Bible says that, that heaven is his throne and that earth is his footstool. Now, now the picture, that's really just a, a great picture for us. You and I, just little bitty you and me, are walking on this, this, this earth that he pretty much just kicks his feet up on. But you can have a relationship with him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to be able to pray and to talk to him. That's good news. Now, Billy, I don't always feel like he hears me. I don't feel like he's, he's listening. It's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard when you pray and pray and pray, and yet you just you don't feel like he's there? You don't feel like he's listening? Well, again, that's some of the stuff that Jesus is talking about. We have to learn to have that relationship with Him. And the first way that you have that relationship with Him is you, you accept His gift of salvation. The Bible says we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. The cost for your sin and for my sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And see, what God calls us to do, what God requires us to do, is He requires us to humbly accept that gift of salvation. And say, God, I know I'm a sinner and I deserve to be punished for my sin, but I believe that Jesus gave His life to die on the cross for my sins. And I accept that gift of salvation from You, Lord. You see, that's the first step to having a relationship with Him. But that's not where it ends. You see, the relationship doesn't, doesn't just end because of that. The relationship moves forward. And so what we learned last week is we need to take time to be alone with God. And then what we learned today is He wants us to learn to just talk to Him from our heart. Are you ticked off at Him? He's been ticked off by people a lot tougher than you, I promise you. Are you sad? Are you hurting? Go to them. You have people who have hurt you? Go to them. 
Here's the thing. God desires for you and me to be sold out to him. Listen to what Jeremiah 29, 13 says. He says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Did you hear the word that he used when you search for me with all of your heart? In other words, God just basically implied to us, there's going to be times where, where I'm not that easy to see. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to think, I'm nowhere close. But what he says here is he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Man, that's good news. God desires, though, all of your heart. He doesn't just want part of it. Nobody would ever sell a house and say, you, I'm going to give you the whole house, but i got this one little closet, this one little area of my house. You can't have that. God wants all of your heart. Not just most of it, not just most of your life. He wants all of it. And then the third and final point of application is this. If you want to thrive in your relationship with God, you have got to forgive. You have got to forgive those people who have hurt you. Those people who have, who have done things that have hurt your family. Those people, and, and, and they, may, they may have known good and well that they were being, they were being hurtful. And that's, the, and that's what hurts you more than anything. If you want to thrive in your relationship with God, you've got to begin to deal with that stuff. Don't let it keep you from having a relationship with God. I'll never forget when I was a, a student pastor that uh, we, we were at, at a deal and the invitation came. And, and, and I leaned over this guy named Jeremy who I'd been praying for for a long, long time. I knew, I knew that he was lost. I knew that he didn't have a relationship with Christ. And I leaned over to him and I said... Jeremy, do you want me to go down there with you? And all he said to me, he, he, was a, he had this real, real deep voice. And he said, to become a Christian, you have to forgive. And I'm not ready to forgive. And don't, don't let your pride keep you from having the relationship with God that he has for you. Listen, you can hold on to your pain. You can hold on to your unforgiveness if you want to. But you're going to be miserable. You're going to be miserable and you're going to pull everybody. You're going to poison everybody around you. Don't hold on to it anymore. You say, well, if I forgive them, they're getting off free. No, they're not. Because they're going to have to stand before God one day if they did it and they know about it. If they've never squared with God themselves, they're going to have to stand before God one day. And even, even if they, they repent, nobody has ever gotten off, off scot-free. You know why? Because Jesus Christ paid for their sins on the cross. The worst thing that anybody, the worst things that you've ever done, Jesus Christ has paid for on the cross. None of, none of our sins have gone unpunished. None of your sins have gone unpunished. So today, what I want to challenge, what I want to encourage you to do, because for some of you, somebody's face comes to your mind. For some of you, there's, there's a name that automatically comes to, comes to your memory. What I want to challenge and what I want to encourage every single one of us to do today is I want us to, to square those things away. Because you will not have the kind of relationship with God that He has planned for you. If you're holding on to bitterness and anger pride and unforgiveness so this morning will you deal with it that may mean that you have to that as soon as you leave here you have to leave and you've got to go call somebody that you have to to go and visit somebody it may it may mean that you have to it might mean that you have to walk across this room to somebody else 
But will you square those things away? Will you take care of those things so that you can have a relationship with God like he has planned for you? I'm going to ask if you would just to bow your heads with me and close your eyes.